Hey, I did this drawing over a period of a few days, beginning with a torso that I did during a sketch jam, and um, that was going to be part of an exquisite corpse, corpse exercise where, you know, each person takes a head, the torso, and and the legs, and you kind of switch off. Um, I think that just kind of goes to show that you can start anywhere with something. Um, and wound up the torso wound up looking kind of monstery, so I thought I would I would kind of finish it off. Um, and so here I just needed to expand the canvas to kind of contain the monster a little bit better. And I sketched it in a head. Uh, you know, the torso was, had the C shape, so I wanted to turn the head kind of counter to it and create this kind of monstery reachy pose. And then um, I like to kind of work like really loose and messy, and sometimes that loose messiness um, suggests potential things. Um, because it's twisting and the and the right hand is kind of reaching, that means the le left leg needed to be forward. So I was, here I'm kind of searching for a pose that would get that left leg forward to balance out the, uh, the right arm and the right shoulder. Um, of course, this is monstery, so it had to be a little bit, a little bit creepy as well, and it's also humanoid, so it had to retain like a certain amount of usable human anatomy. Um, and you know, the trick to making anything creepy is to use lots of darks, lots of sharp angles, and lots of triangular shapes. I didn't know what the feet were going to be yet, um, so I kind of just sketched them in loosely um, with a normal sort of foot, and. Um, the kind of mistake that I made was to extend the heel out too long, so I thought that might be a cool spike to put on the back. Um, you know, now I'm getting to the, I've I've gotten to the point where I've, you know, put the whole figure in at least in a draft, and now it's about deciding um, what works and what doesn't work. Um, so this foot looks too big in the front. Um, the back leg looks too narrow and too skinny, especially in comparison to the to the front leg. It looks um, kind of distorted, so I'm gonna have to play around with that. One of the nice things about just kind of loosely erasing and, and working gesturally is that this kind of builds up texture and style in a way that um, I didn't really plan on, and by working these shapes around, it wound up doing something that I didn't really intend, but was probably better than what I had in my mind. Um, so the advantage to working digitally and to working on one layer like this is that you can endlessly push and pull things by working with a basically a full opacity brush. In this case, it's just a simple triangular brush. You could use the round or whatever, and then just erasing and pushing it back and forth. So um, if you start to work in a bunch of layers, you kind of lose that ability. So in a way, like working very simply like this has an advantage over working with multiple layers and so on. Um, and this is very much a comic book way to work, too. Normally in comic books you would do the penciling and then you, this is what you would do in the inking stage um, with a little more confidence because the pencil line uh, drawing would be a little more developed and better. Um, so here it's all compressed into one stage and um, a lot of this stuff is about finding, finding the pose, finding the shape. And this is a very two-dimensional way to work um, even though it's based on a kind of forms, the shape um, is really what counts in the end. The shapes have to be cool and creepy and they have to indicate the form as well. And for a long time I tend to work a little bit zoomed out like this so I can see how every little thing that I do affects the whole. Um, I find that if I get zoomed in on something and develop it a lot too early on I will mess up and have to redo all of it completely, um, which is fine. I don't mind redoing anything and, and painting stuff more. It's just, um, it can be frustrating um, if you didn't intend to spend that time on it. Um, so 
here I'm kind of playing around with the head and trying to figure out what that could look like. And I thought about short horns or, you know, what direction that the horns would kind of go because I wanted it to be a little bit devilly, kind of like maybe something out of the Northern Renaissance, like like Albert Durer would make or somebody like that. Um, and so that involved throwing out different directions really quick and then eliminating sort of the worst ones. Um, and here I was bringing a little bit, a little bit of anatomy too, you know, working on the deltoid and making sure that the sort of muscle structure work works. Um, that was something that, that I learned in the last figure class that I took that was, you know, you could do basically any distortion as long as the joints work. So that's really what I wanted to focus on here. Um, and I thought about giving this thing an ear here with that little shape on the, on top of the jaw, but it didn't seem right to give it a full ear. I thought that would be too humanoid. Um, and to create some half tones, I started hatching into some areas and that sort of suggested that maybe this could involve a fair amount of, of hatching or cross hatching to get some of the transitions going. Um, and when you're making stuff up like this, it's important to, to, you know, especially without a reference, it's important to remember what form that you're working on at any given moment. So the spikes that are coming off the clavicles, I was thinking of just extended clavicles. Those are basically just cylinders. So wrapping lines around them like a cylinder um, made sense to me. Um, and here I had, you know, I hadn't done anything with the mouth, so indicating some teeth on the jaw, even though there's no real light that was going to be getting there. Um, that indication might have helped um, just indicate what's there, um, even though that might need to change. And, you know, again, when we get to the horns, we're again working on just a basic cylinder. So remembering that you're working on a funky shaped, simple form is always good. And I thought it needed some kind of nose or some indication of sort of the skeletal structure. So the erased bits that I had would kind of work there. And then, you know, this was starting to create a tangent with the, with the um, trapezius and the mouth there. So I had to kind of play around with how that intersected um, so that it would seem like the mouth is definitively overlapping and not running into a form that should be in the background. And sometimes you do have to like go back and clean up some of the mess. Um, that's the disadvantage of working this way is that you, the mess can get out of hand and can work against you. And it, but it's the, the trade-off is that the fight is also productive, you know? So you kind of make this judgment and calculation about, well, you know, am I hurting myself or am I helping myself go in directions that I didn't expect. And that's kind of what, you know, what I like to, I like to have processes where I can work back and forth and push back and forth and, and have a little bit of fight. But if you don't like that, this might not be the, the best method to work with, um, even though it can lead to some strong advantages. But, you know, I would try it a few times um, and see if you like it. It, it can... Um, it can also be used just as a way to start. You know, you don't have to necessarily take this to finish like I'm going to in this one. So here, um, I needed a third tone to differentiate. Um, initially, I was thinking this would be a two-tone kind of drawing, like stark darks versus stark lights. But it just doesn't work. Um, uh, a lot of the times. So what I had to do for the jaw was create um, sort of half tones with hatching to be able to differentiate the lights from the darks um, and to create um, the shapes that I needed to create and get them all to overlap. Um, because it was getting a little bit chaotic. And um, here I was kind of struggling with the arms and trying to figure out how big they should be relative to the figure. Um, and the, cause I thought the upper body was so complex that it needed a lot of attention to work. And 
the torso had already been developed uh, a fair amount, but that needed some work too. Like it needed to have the uh, the side of the abdominal muscles, and it needed, um, you know, I, I struggled with whether or not to put a belly button there um, because it, it wasn't necessarily birthed, but maybe it was. Um, I wound up leaving the belly button in. Um, because it's it's largely a um, indicator of a center point, um, and here I was using the the muscle that um, is on top of the or on the inside of the the forearm there in the inside of the elbow to kind of transition that form from the upper arm to the lower arm, and um, I wanted this to go in foreshortening, but at this stage it didn't work. Um, I'll have to re I, I'll come back and reevaluate that later. Um, so here, I'm just stepping back and reanalyzing the uh, the leg got bent kind of in the, this weird direction, which I thought was neat, but it wasn't actually kind of productive for the forms that I think would have been necessary. So this overall shape is significantly better, um, but that meant the legs were kind of getting a little bit big. Um, especially compared to the torso and arms. So that was kind of throwing some disproportion upwards. Um, and here I was creating a, a tangent with the arm. It was getting too close to the, to the hip. So I thought it would kind of play around with that, move it, twist it, um, change the size until it created a shape. And what, when you work with shapes like this, one of the tricks is to try not to create parallel lines, right? They can be close to parallel. But if they're directly parallel, it kind of creates stasis. And that stasis can be really useful sometimes, but not most of the time. Most of the time, you want more dynamism. So um, I was really playing around with getting that arm to be not parallel to everything else. Um, and here, it looks like it's kind of going straight out. And so the, the upper part of the arm looks a little short. So that's going to have to change uh, a little bit later. Uh, we'll get back into sort of this reevaluating stage. Um, and I had done some sketches on the side, kind of figured that I wanted sort of a, a three claw toe. Um, and that would be pretty easy to draw in, and that should work pretty well. Um, if you can do good heads, hands, and feet, you can pretty much do anything with the figure. And if you can make those really convincing, I think that's, you know, excellent. There's not more you could really ask for in, in sort of uh, monstery figure drawing. You know, if you can, if you can make that connection to the ground with the feet, the connection to a mind with the head and the, and the connection to, you know, your viewership, you know, with the claws and, and hands into the world around it. Um, that's really what makes something convincing. And you know, I thought of more spikes you could put on. So, you know, a spike coming off the top of the of that thumb. And um, here I'm going back to basics, just saying, well, you know, if light's coming from above, there should be some value transition, right? Um, you should have values that... Um, that get darker as you go further from the light source. So, you know, not just working with shapes, but working with basic um, drawing concepts is, is where it's at as far as this stuff goes. Um, and even taking that down on the small level where each joint of the finger has some value transition to it as well. Um, and that's easy to do when you remember that you're just working on a cylinder, you know. Each joint is a is just a basic cylinder. It might be organic or modified or turned a different way, but it's still just a cylinder. Um, same thing here, right? You're working with parts of cylinders on a deltoid that's overlapping on top of another cylinder for the bicep and tricep. And here I wanted to really pay attention to how this all connected. Um, like what's the final shape of the arm? How skinny is it? Um, where is the bulge of the bicep? Where is the bulge of the tricep? And um, how did the lat muscle come 
how does that come out in the back there? Um, and then cleaning up and flattening out that shape is also critical. It was starting to get a little bit um, too textured. So I thought I'd spend some time like just kind of cleaning and making decisions about like what the shape of all these spiky things were and how that related to the actual anatomy of the arm. And then again, back to the idea of value transitions. Um, so the tricep has uh, its bulge kind of closer to the elbow. The bicep has its bulge closer to the deltoid. So it's a simple way to indicate, you know, where the arm is and um, what angle it's at and to be a little bit more anatomically convincing. So here I was working on the, the way that the muscle and the bone would overlap as it comes down the elbow. Um, and I skip around, you know, go back to the deltoid after thinking about it for a while, you know, go back to the tricep, realize that it's all still too skinny anyway, and then, you know, trust myself to figure it out later, come develop this hand. <laughs> it's sort of a, a funny way of working, but I find that um, when you skip around, it helps out because everything kind of develops together at the same time. Um, and it feels less disastrous to make drastic changes when everything's kind of in flux all the time. And um, if you have something overdeveloped and you have to make all these big changes, it can be really frustrating because you've put so much work into this one thing and it's perfect and you don't want to change it, but it's not working and you have to change all this stuff to get that to work. So the way I figure it is, if you don't develop anything, um, overdevelop anything until everything else is kind of ready, you're in better shape um, in the long run to make all this stuff work. Um, and here with the hands, I'm just working on simple shapes and basic overlaps, right? Um, if you can work with these simple shapes and get the simple shapes working, everything else kind of happens. And here what wound up happening is I thought that here I was drawing sort of the middle finger, but this became the forefinger um, later on uh, because it just seemed to be in a more natural position for the forefinger. Um, and then the middle finger wound up being what I first thought was the forefinger. So there, and you can see it now, the, the sort of relationship flipped um, and I just sort of went with it even though it was a total um, total mistake uh, and I wound up getting developed a little bit better later on in the, in the process. One of the most important points of anatomy here is how the leg connects to the hip and uh, because it's sort of in the foreground it's in the center and that needed some attention right of how to get the quads and the uh, vastus lateralis muscle to work and get that connected to the knee and then to get the structure of the knee it's it's sort of boxy and triangular right so the patella you could think of that as being the sort of the front of the box and the top of the box it you know leads up to the quads through that big um, uh, set of tendons and ligaments and then you lead down into the shin bone and all the, all the complex muscles into the into the calf and having a little bit of knowledge of that anatomy um, would help. If you didn't, that's okay though, because um, what matters ultimately is just the shape. And if you can get these creepy shapes going and get the joint working, everything else is gonna be, um, gonna be okay. Um, and the nice thing about monsters is that you can make all these distortions and, and you can work on basic ideas and you can just say, hey, I've got this shape um, laid out. You know, what is its most basic form? And then work on that basic form. And that can be a way to simplify it enough where it's understandable. And sometimes things get too simple and you need to complexify them. Like I thought that foot was too simplistic. So I thought I would give it a, a little bit of a bend and um, change that plane a little bit. And then I realized that the upper arm, after looking at it, you know, uh, at a different time period, that the upper arm wasn't really connecting well 
to the pectoralis muscles. So I really needed to rework that connection and um, it just wasn't working out and wasn't working out. So um, this probably took like three or four or five tries to kind of get this connection working properly um, because the, the pectoral muscles work in sort of an X pattern and they connect um, in a couple of different places because you have the, the major and minor muscles there. And I felt like selling that was the key to selling the arms and selling the, the extended bony clavicles that come out of the skin and become bone. And then sometimes you zoom out and you notice something that is unrelated to what you're working on. Um, so here I kind of noticed that I hadn't done anything with the foot in a while, so I needed to come back and mess with that foot and start to figure out exactly how that was going to go. And essentially it's it's a, cup, a box form, a sort of uh, prismatic wedge form, some cones and cylinders all juggled together. And you'll notice here first what I'm doing is just the generic shape, and then I'm converting it to form. And so it's a really basic process that um, that I've shown in other places and I still use it all the time even for the most complex things because it's just so so useful it's just like it's such a powerful way to work it's really simple and it's just effective and you should try it out if you're not doing that already um, and you know with hatching there's basically two directions that you can go you know you can go you go with the form in either direction that it goes and that's that's like the main ways you hatch there's other ways to do it you know that are more expressive but if you're trying to describe form the best ways are just to go along the two directions that the form goes so in a cylinder you just go straight down the length and then arc down across the side it's it's no more complicated than that um so here I'm just taking another step back, looking at it, reevaluating. Um, I thought it was time to work on the ground shadow because that was going to give information about how the form is standing um, in a way that drawing just the form can't. And when I started working on that, I realized I didn't exactly know how the heel um, bone spike was happening. So I needed to pay attention to, the, to that. The idea was that you know, the bone in the back of your heel was just extended into like a claw point thing. And um, that could be potentially funky and interesting and scary. Um, so now it's a matter of taking that and working it into the, to the back foot. And because it's in the back, um, I don't want to spend as much time on the front or make it as quite as detailed. And um, but what I needed to do is get it specific and in sort of a shorthand where it was convincing in its shape, but not overwhelming in its detail where it was going to fight the rest of the drawing. And you also notice that there's a bunch of just like a mess of marks in there. So all of that needs to get cleaned up and flattened out so that it makes a little more sense. Um, sometimes text like an overwhelming amount of texture that's out of control like that can be cool. Other times it can just be distracting and annoying. So um, it's kind of a stylistic judgment as to what you need to do with that sort of um, with that sort of idea, right? If you're you're writing this fine line of, you know, how stylized do I make it? Um, how crazy can I get away with? And when does that mess become unproductive? I think that's the thing. Because there's like a productive looseness, a productive mess, and then there's a mess that's just a mess and looks bad. So um, the main thing that I was thinking about was just throw this mostly into a single, relatively clean, um, all black, dark sh leg shape, and it'll sit in the background, throw a little light on the toes, and it'll kind of work. Um, and then I realized that I hadn't done anything with sort of the, the spikes that were coming off of the um, scapula in the back um, and 
it just needed to be a little bit paid attention to, not like super detailed or anything, but just enough to make sure that the overlap is clear. Because I kind of like these chaotic marks that are happening in the background. Um, some of the marks survived all the way from the original sketch too. Um, and here I'm just taking a step back and realizing, is there anything that bothers me, right? You know, one of the things that, that bugged me is that it looked like this arm, the right arm, the one on the left, um, looked like it was just kind of hanging down and it was really short. So I wanted to, to work on the foreshortening. So I put up another layer and did a little sketch of what that foreshortening element should look like the, with the cylinders kind of coming towards you and the, the forearm being definitively in front and the deltoid having more of a feeling of just like wrapping around rather than, than um, you know, dangling straight down. So that was the project for, for here. And um, if I could get this to be foreshortened, then I wouldn't have to change the shape of the overall figure. You know, I like the overall shape, so I didn't want to change that, and I wanted to, to you know, try to foreshorten it so that it would work that way. Um, of course, this took a bunch of, you know, refinement and tries, right, and losing some of what I had already done in the forearm. I already basically rendered the whole forearm, so now I had to erase into it to kind of rework it, and, you know, that's the breaks, right? It's like, you like drawing? it's fine to draw it again sometimes, you know? So there, it's it's working a little better now. Um, the the idea that it's coming forward more is is becoming a thing. Um, it probably would have been better to maybe overlap the hand over the knee or something like that. Um, but, you know, you do the best you can within one sketch and then leave it alone and do better on the next one. <laughs> at least at least that's the way I like to think about it. Um, there's only so much you can do. And then I wanted this arm to kind of go back, so I really had to work to get this cylinder, <coughs> cylinder of the upper arm, to kind of overlap that back forearm to make sure that it felt like it was going backwards, and then that forearm was turning and coming down. Um, because I'd kind of connected it a little more flat and... Um, I guess that's kind of, I had rushed through the shape to form stage. If I had paid more attention in the form stage, done more construction, um, rather than approaching it fully two-dimensionally, I probably wouldn't have come up with that error. Um, and now it's looking pretty good. You know, when you zoom out, you want that stage, that look to be very creepy, um, even at a distance. And so it looks pretty creepy and it looks pretty good. And then, you know, I still needed to refine the, the way that everything kind of connected and um, how that worked. So um, I think I just left it here. You know, it could go further to finish, but as far as a, a finished sketch um, monster idea, I'd say it's, uh, it's pretty far along. I hope you got a lot out of this video and I hope you enjoyed seeing something kind of develop in this uh, two-dimensional and sketchy way. Thanks for watching.